Well, happy Easter. Glad to have you with us today. I'm Paul Johnson. And I'll be leading you through this week's virtual service. It is a great day and a special day in the life of the church. And we invite you to check in by saying hello in the comments section of however you're watching this. Please join Ben on Facebook Live at 1.43 p.m. Monday through Thursdays. These little sessions last about 10 to 15 minutes and are a great way to connect with one another during our busy weeks. Our weekly Bible study is held on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. and Thursdays at 8, 3, 8 p.m. through Zoom. Both sessions are the same, so you can choose the time that works best for your schedule. In our current study, we are delving deeper into the scripture reading used in our services each week. Our social justice team is planning a Be the Church Day on May 22nd. This is a Sunday when instead of gathering for our normal worship service, we will worship through our serving in, a commun in our community. It's a spe really special day and we'd love for you to be a part of it. Send us a message here on Facebook or email to let us know you'd like to participate. Or if you know of an agency that might be in need of volunteers for that day for help, please let us know. And now let's continue with worship on this very special day of days. Doubters, believers, disciples, deceivers, come to the one who makes all things new. The door of faithfulness is open to us today. God beckons us to enter and find forgiveness and a new life. The God whom we have rejected offers all acceptance and healing. Let us pray together. O oh God, we come to you today dazzled by your blinding light. Your majesty is overwhelming and your promise of grace brings hope to our lives. We remember those among us who are weary and ill. We bring them to you in prayer and that hope for that they might find peace and healing in your realm. God, we resist the changes that we know we must make to receive a new life. Save us from our selfish ways and rescue us from all of our harmful and destructive habits. Heal our broken relationships and lift our wounded spirits so that we may share in the resurrection of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming, bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces towards the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all of these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, 
he saw only the linen cloth. Then he returned home, wondering what had happened. Our second reading this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. Look, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. Past events won't be remembered. They won't come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating, because I am creating Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a source of gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad about my people. No one will ever hear the sound of weeping or crying in it again. No more babies live only a few days, or the old fail to live out their days. The one who dies a hundred at a hundred will be like a young person, and the one falling short of a hundred will seem cursed. They will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They won't build for others to live in, nor plant for others to eat. Like the days of a tree will be these days of my people. My chosen will make full use of their handiwork. They won't labor in vain, nor bear children to a world of horrors, because they will be people blessed by the Lord, they along with their descendants. Before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, I will hear. Wolf and lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but the snake, its food will be dust. They won't hurt or destroy at any place on my holy mountains, says the Lord. These are the readings of God for the people of God. We've looked everywhere. Oliver's a avid reader. Oftentimes we'll go to the library and check out 10 books and by the end of the week he will have read all 10 books and it's time to head back to the library and turn them in. But as an avid reader, he likes to read just about anywhere he is. So whether he is in uh, his toy room, in his bedroom, in the living room, in our bedroom, or in the kitchen, dining room, or anywhere else in the house, he has books. And when we check out 10 library books, they end up all over the house. And so when it comes time to go get more library books, he has to start his hunt for all the books he checked out last time. A couple of weeks ago, he had finished his books. The 10 books we were sure we checked out from the library were scattered all over the house and Tammy was ready to take him back to the library to turn them in and get some new books. So she said, Oliver, go find your books. Pretty quickly, he had come back downstairs and there in a pile on our dining room table were eight books. We counted them several times to make sure because he knew that one book was still missing. He knew which book was missing. But there was another book that seemed to be missing as well. We only had eight books. We looked and we looked and we looked and we looked and still only eight books. We couldn't find nine and 10. Oliver pretty soon started saying, I'm pretty sure we only checked out nine books. He knew one was missing. He knew he had read the other eight and he couldn't come up with another one that he had read. And so he kept telling Tammy and I, I'm pretty sure we only checked out nine books. No, we, we checked out 10. We both told him several times before. Finally, I said, okay, let me check. And I looked up the email receipt we had gotten from the library. And sure enough, we had checked out nine books. Good news, we were only missing one book but we were still missing that one book. Eventually we gave up that day finding the last book and we decided we wouldn't turn the books in yet. We'd have to find the other one before we could get him more books. And so we went on about our day. The next day we decided, okay, now we really need to find that last book. We know what we're looking for. I said, Oliver, have you looked in your room? Have you looked in your toy room? Have you looked in our bedroom? Have you looked in the dining room? Have you looked in the living room? Have we checked the couch cushions? We've looked everywhere. I'll be honest, I had not been giving it my best efforts because I thought it was Oliver's responsibility to find his books. But at this point, looked everywhere meant, okay, I need to, to jump in and really start looking. Pulling up couch cushions, looking between ottomans and walls, looking in places that only I could get to, lifting up couches, those kinds of things. And so, 
I got to work, lifted up the couch, lifted up our big chair, looked under beds, looked behind dressers, looked all over the house. Finally, I thought, well, I don't think anybody's looked in Oliver's closet. I don't know why the book would be in there, but I'm going to go look. We've reached the point in time where we're looking places that it makes no sense for this thing to be. But we're looking anyway because we couldn't find it in any of the normal places. And so I go upstairs, open his closet up, look through the assorted toys and other things. Still no luck. I close the closet doors and I turn around and there in the middle of Oliver's dresser with nothing on top of it, nothing anywhere else close to it is the book. Just sitting there in the most obvious place it could possibly have been found. We had searched and searched and searched for this book, and there it is, just sitting right in the middle of his dresser. I called Oliver up to his room, and he said, what? I said, I found your book. He said, where? And he started looking again through piles of stuffed animals, through toys on his bookshelves, and the whole time I'm just sitting there looking at the book in the middle of his dresser. Finally, he turns around, and he looks, and there's the book, and he goes, Oh, and starts laughing. We had looked in all of the places. We'd looked everywhere for this one book. Except in the most obvious and easiest place we could have found it. Because that's the thing. When something is lost, we assume it's not going to easily be found. And oftentimes we may find ourselves looking in all the wrong places. In fact, we may become so overwhelmed by the process of trying to find it that we might decide that there's more than one thing to find, like Tammy and I did. That's what Easter is really about. It is about Jesus' resurrection and us finding our way to Jesus. In this morning's gospel reading, the angels ask the women, why are you looking for the living among the dead? When I read that question, it asks me two different questions. First, it asks me the question of, what are you looking for here? The angels answer the question themselves a bit by saying, he told you that he would be risen. He told you that he would return. He told you he would come back to life. So why did you come here, the place where his body was laid, where he was dead, to look for the one that is living? It is a question that can be asked of any and all of us. Why do we look for Jesus in the places that don't fit with him? Why do we look for the way of Jesus Christ in the ways of this world. Easter invites us to a new way, to a different way. It invites us to imagine the world as Isaiah imagines it, that God is doing a new thing. And if God is doing a new thing, we are not going to find that new thing by doing it in old ways. We've looked everywhere that makes sense to us. We've looked all over the place where we can think of. But Jesus' way, the Easter way, God's way is not our way. It is not going to be found within our own rationality. It is not going to be found by the way that we have always done things. It is not going to be found among the powers and principalities of this world. The ways that have led for generations to death to violence, to destruction, to suffering. Instead, it will be found in other ways, in new ways, in the ways of God. So this Easter season, because Easter is not just a day, let's look for the new ways of Jesus, the new things that Jesus is doing. Let's suspend our understanding of how things have to be in order to enter into the way that Jesus says things can be and should be and need to be. 
the early followers of Jesus after his resurrection called their movement the way because it was different. It was a different way of being, of doing, of living in the world. A way that moved narrowly toward life in a world that was oriented toward death. And so the angels asked the man, why are you here looking for Jesus? He's not here. He told you. And they remember and they believe the good news. And so they go away and they look where Jesus said he would be found, where they are gathered. They return to the other disciples. These women's are, women are disciples too. They had heard Jesus' teaching. And so they return to the other disciples and tell them the good news. That they had received a message that the Lord is risen from angels. But there's a second way that that question can be heard. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? What is it that you're looking for? Do you know? Do you know what led you here? To that, I think the women can actually answer yes. And they find the good news of Jesus Christ right there among the dead. They don't have to wait till they see him because it is their love for Jesus that leads them and guides them to the way of Jesus. Not their rationality, not their understanding. They have gone out toward the tomb ready to anoint Jesus' body with the spices that they have prepared, but they don't know how they're going to get in. They don't know who will roll, roll the stone away. They go in love and in faith. Why are you here? The angels asked the women. And the women, I'm sure, could say, because we love him. Because we believe in him. Because we know that this is not the end of the story. We will go on following him wherever he is. And this is the last place we knew him to be. So we came here. Because death does not frighten us because death is not the end of the story. We came here because we knew even in a place where death thinks it reigns, new life is coming. New life will sprout forth from the earth. And so the women say, we know, we know that Jesus is still with us. And so death does not scare us away. They can face their grief. They can face the tragedy. They can face the pain and the violence that the world has wrought. The death which was wielded by those in power to stop the story of Jesus. They can face all of that because they know even among all of that, God's life will continue to burst forth. This, too, is the way of Jesus. To not turn away from suffering. To not turn away from death. To not turn away from pain. Because it scares us. Because we don't like the way it looks or feels. But to seek God's way. To seek God's life even in the midst of it knowing that redemption is coming, knowing that life will continue to find a way, knowing that love will have the last word. And so we can continue to find the living way in a world that sometimes makes us want to stand up and shout hallelujah in celebration, but also in a world that sometimes makes us feel beaten down and defeated. We can continue to walk along the living way, facing all of it, because we know Jesus, because he lives.
we too can walk along his living way. As we go through the next seven weeks, let's focus in on what that way is, on what that way means. Because it is in living in that way that we will help others find life in the face of a world that's hurting, in a world of suffering, in a world that says the only way to overcome is to wield the power of death and destruction. We can show another way, the way of life, of creation, of love, the living way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Love does not exist unless it's given away. In the Christian faith, God gave God's love away by creating the incarnation, which was the person of Jesus. And God's love for humanity was given away when he offered himself up to death. God gave Jesus, and Jesus gave his life all done in a love that was given away. And in both cases, the love continues. Easter is the witness that love is stronger than death. That's sometimes hard to believe and difficult to embrace. It certainly was for Peter, who had a rather famous conversation as recorded in John's Gospel. Three times the risen Christ asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? Three times, Peter answers that indeed he does love Jesus. And three times, the risen Lord asks Peter to feed my sheep. Pass the love on because it doesn't exist unless it's given away. On this Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection which is the gift of a divine love that cannot be shut down by death or by fear or anger, disappointment or grief. This enormous gift of love has been given to us and we are challenged to pass it on. Please pray with me. We give you thanks, O God, for you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. In the good news of the resurrection, which we celebrate today, Easter Sunday, we have discovered that your love leads us to new life in Christ. In the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup, we celebrate the conquering everlasting, ever-living love of the empty tomb. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray, amen. And as they ate, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily, I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. We may be scared off of saying what we're going to do, how we're going to show up for God, what we're going to offer 
to God because it might not turn out the way we want. But this Sunday, this Palm and Passion Sunday reminds us that it's not about things turning out the way we want. It's about offering what we can. We are reminded in the Palm procession that shouting Hosanna, even when you don't know what that word means, is still a proclamation. Jesus is the Messiah. It is an attempt at following. We are reminded that even when we offer up, I will follow you as far as necessary, and it falls short. That is still an offering that God blesses, and an offering that eventually can lead to redemption. And so whatever it is God is calling us to offer, to share, whatever ways we're being called to serve or to give, or to just show up, we can name it, trusting that it may not turn out the way we expect, but that God will continue to work it toward good, toward redemption, toward healing and wholeness. Amen. And now, if you will please bow for our benediction. Go in the way of Christ, the way of life, of love, of hope. Go in the way of the one who lives, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let's get out there and give them heaven.